prosecution is saying that the gun uh, could have gone off with a 12 pound uh, trigger. And the defense is saying it would have gone off with a two pound trigger. And this is key because uh, Mr. MacGyver had a known sleeping disorder called REM behavior disorder. And that causes sudden jerks and actions. And if it only was two pounds, it is very easy for this to go off by accident. First of all, it seems like she is trying to speculate that the file cabinets coulda, woulda, shoulda had this, uh, had documents that may have been important and circumstantial evidence to prove motive of why Mr. McIver should be found guilty. Um, but as you saw, the judge did, uh, did jump in and tell and redirect her to stop with any speculation and to focus only on what she saw. Um, so then she focused on finding the file cabinets empty. Uh, just from a point of legal analysis, and if you've been following this case, there's been speculation of a secret will. So it seems to be to me that she's implying that this secret will may have or coulda, woulda, shoulda been in uh, these empty file cabinets. But also as a side, these file cabinets are at their ranch, their second home. So I'm not sure it would make sense to even uh, jump to the conclusion that the ranch should have her personal items and paperwork. Uh, this, this is a second home. So, you know, at this point, the state is putting on their case. It's a bunch of circumstantial evidence, which will be weighed by the jury, uh, you know, and at, at the end of the case, they'll pay attention to all the evidence and the totality of the circumstances and come down with a verdict. But they, you know, it's important to note that this case must be proved beyond any and all reasonable doubt. And just, yeah. ju you know, there might be a bunch of circumstantial evidence that could tip the scales to show a preponderance, but we really need to have overwhelming evidence to prove a, a criminal case of yeah. murder. Uh, she seems to just be going to the point of, you know, him com them coming in. I, we've heard that when he's come in, he yelled, gunshot, gunshot. Um, and I guess she's trying to uh, lend evidence or some kind of visual, circumstantial evidence of uh, what happened that day and who she spoke with, those doctors, to lend credibility of their later testimony. Um, and she also was able to obtain their medical records, which goes to Mr. McIver's point of wanting to go to Emory Hospital uh, because she was a previous patient there and they were familiar with her medical history. Yeah. Uh, he's trying to cast doubt on the prosecution's case. This is cross-examination, so they just had uh, the state go forward asking a bunch of questions to bolster her testimony, and now the defense is coming in to cast doubt on that testimony. The notes are relevant because he's trying to find out or probe whether or not there's additional information, supplemental information, uh, conflicting information that could be in her, that could be either excluded from her report or uh, written differently in the report. And I think he's getting to the point of trying to poke holes in the case to try to get those notes to see what they say so we can compare them to make sure that they're actually included and reflected uh, in the actual uh, report that she's talking about now because he's now bringing into the situation and into the scenario these other notes these handwritten notes well what handwritten notes where are they why can't we see them so th that's his job now we are in cross-examination to start poking holes at the prosecution's witness and at the prosecution's case to cast doubt uh, you know in this matter so um, you know I think we can continue to keep listening to him and what he's going to say and how he's going to continue to cast doubt before redirect yeah Two things there. Um, we're going to be hearing from lots of witnesses. As uh, if you've been following this trial, they are saying close to maybe 90 or more. So it is going to be with all the investigation and circumstantial evidence that they need to present. It, a lot of it is relying on what other people may have said. So it's very important that the questions are phrased properly because there can't be hearsay. It has to be evidence that is admissible into court. And also just to comment on what you just said about uh, the the defense team and the prosecution team, I think. I think that's to be expected in a case like this. When you're talking about such a high profile media case out of Atlanta where there was speculation that the trial may have had to have even been moved for venue to have a fair trial, I think it makes sense that the, the state would be uh, putting their most experienced, their most senior, their most uh, credible, uh, hardworking, big gun prosecutors on the case. And it also would make sense that Mr. McIver, who, you know, is from, you know, even if there's, you know, uh, 
insinuations that he had no money and that he outspended himself. He definitely had enough money uh, to hire a great defense lawyer and lawyer up. And uh, it makes sense that both sides would have the big guns in this case. Well, let's see. So there was a, a question and then there was a hearsay objection and then there was a speculation about whether or not those file cabinets uh, were empty and to her knowledge uh, were always empty and uh, they were trying to pry into speculation which is an objection so the judge then jumped in and asked her directly which she then looked at counsel to see if she should answer and then the judge repeated himself and asked again directly I'm asking you to your knowledge other than someone else telling you, have you or do you know from your own knowledge that those file cabinets had anything in it ever? And her answer was no. So that was key. Um, that was key because the file cabinets were found empty. That's all it is. Anything else is speculation of what those file cabinets coulda, woulda, shoulda had. Um, it's not as common, so it'll be interesting to see what they ask and how uh, how the witness handles the questions and also if there's any objections and what kind of objections they are. We've certainly seen a lot of objections this morning for hearsay and speculation, um, you know, and the witness being re-instructed to testify only to her knowledge of what she saw and what she knows directly. Uh, so this will, this will be an interesting next phase. Do you think she was an important witness? Um, I think she was important for the prosecution to help paint a picture of uh, who Mr. McIver is and to try to build prejudice and to give circumstantial evidence that could lend an opinion for the jury to make their ultimate uh, decision and verdict. Uh, she's important for them because she's testifying that the file cabinet was empty, which goes to the speculation, and it is just speculation of a second will. Right now, we have no evidence that has come in that a second will or a secret will actually exists. We also have no evidence that that file cabinet ever had documents in it, and it's possible that it never did. This was their second home. Um, but it is important because she's a witness to help paint the picture, and that's what it's all about. I mean, the state puts on their case, and they paint a picture about the defendant, and then the jury gets to ask questions yeah. and weigh the evidence. I guess the jury is trying to figure out what casing was actually part of the death and evaluated and which ones were testers and why there were so many casings. Uh, the jury is trying to make sense of a previous comment she made earlier uh, in testimony when she couldn't recall how many casings there were and how many testing, uh, testings that there were. Um, and there was no follow-up questions uh, by either counsel. So it seems like that was just a question of the jury trying to figure out how many casings may have actually been used that night. Well, right. And we still don't know that there is a second will or a secret will. This is just part of painting the picture of who he is and to, and to give circumstantial evidence of why he may or may not be guilty. Um, you know, according to the defense, that property was always going to go to the godson and he was okay with that. So, but according to the prosecution, that was motive motive for him to kill her and paint it to be an accident so he didn't stand to lose the property. Right. So this is all going to have to be weighed by the jury at the end based on the picture that's painted and it is going to rely heavily on witness testimony and circumstantial evidence. Well, the prosecution's going to get past it by painting a picture of motive, uh, of financial gain. But why would you say it then? Why would you say it was an accident? I think they need, the jury needs to listen to that. I think that there is doubt all over this case, and this is going to be a very difficult case to prove beyond any and all reasonable doubt. We have to remember we're in the criminal standard here. It's the criminal burden, um, and that's a difficult burden to reach. You know, there can't be reasonable doubt. So... If she's saying it was an accident, it was an accident, that's the only, that's the only testimony so, the jury's ever going to hear from the victim. The prosecution. The other but way, but if, if, if they say no, then they're taking that no out of context. And under the rule of completeness, the defense attorney can and should object and say, no, 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 I want the rest of that no phrase included. What, was, what did she say after that no? 
Well, and that's part of the case that's going to have to be put on, and the jury's going to have to weigh the evidence. But I think it's important to, you know, look at the situation. They were in an area that they felt compromised in. She handed him the gun. It was in the plastic bag. He shot it from the plastic bag. It was still in the plastic bag when he shot the gun. It went through the seat. I mean, if he really wanted to kill yeah. her, there's other ways to do it. Exactly. Well, and not only that, you know, shooting through a seat where there's metal in the seat could have caused the gun to rake it and come back and actually shoot him. Okay. So there's a whole lot of things that could have gone wrong if he was trying to kill his wife. I mean, the gun could have ricketed back to him. He could have caused an accident because he could have startled the driver. I mean, there's, there's, there are other ways to do it. He also could have taken it out of the bag to, to shoot it in a, in a way that he could have secured and made sure she was going to die. Every case is different and every jury is different. And you know, you and I can sit here and, and, and take an analysis of this and we don't know what was going through his mind that day. It's possible, it's very possible, it doesn't mean it's reasonable, but it's possible that she handed him the gun, he started to think about financial problems and issues, mm -hmm. and he just pulled the trigger. And then he freaked out and he panicked and now he's, you know, trying to cover it up and saying it was an accident, but he may have had a moment of you know, uh, panic. We won't know that. We don't know. The, the issue is, is whether we can prove that it was an intentional killing and not an accident beyond any and all reasonable doubt. They kept showing that to the jury. I believe they showed it to the jury around four times. Um, that is another picture to paint about Mr. McIver, uh, which in my opinion is, uh, it's, it's to distract, it's to paint a negative picture, it's to portray a prejudice that he, he's for guns, he's for shooting, he's for taking matters into his own hands, and he doesn't dial 911. Because in this case, after this killing happened, he didn't dial 911. He took matters into his own hands by driving his wife to, or continuing to have the car drive his wife to the hospital and the yeah. ER. He picked the hospital. But I think it's a long shot. You know, that's a that's a decorative piece. That's a decorative sign on someone's property. It was a huge ranch. You heard it was over 100 acres. And it is very common on properties to have signs like we have dogs or you loot, we shoot or, you know, it, you know, certain homes. Uh, you know, I don't know what the law is in this state, but they have standard ground laws. So if someone enters your property and you feel compromised, you have the right and it is a justified killing to shoot and kill. So to me, that's a decorative sign to just say, um, you know, don't intrude on our property. We won't call 911. We'll take matters into our own hands. But that's, I don't think. Don't look at it more than it is. I don't think say. it's related at all. I think it is pro a prosecution's way of trying to paint a negative picture that's prejudicial about Mr. McIver. And, you know, hey, a visual's worth a thousand words, and they were able to show that visual many times, and you'll probably keep seeing it. Uh, I think they're just trying to, the prosecution is trying to uh, lend more circumstantial evidence to uh, show why this might be suspicious. He had never really been to the office before. He was in and out real fast. His demeanor was that of someone that wasn't happy. Um, and they're trying to build a case to show why this may have been a suspicious moment um, because he's never been there before. and. Uh, you know, I think he got in a back door. She didn't buzz him in. There was, you know, it stood out to her because he's, he wasn't someone that was regularly patroning the office and it was out of context and he didn't look happy. So she remembered the moment and the state wants to memorialize that moment. Uh, I thought that the defense attorney came, did a very good job uh, refocusing how anyone who has the code doesn't need permission to enter the building. For all we know, Diane McIver could have given her husband the code to go in the building real fast to go do something for her real fast. And, you know, you heard from the witness, she has no personal relationship with Diane. She has no personal relationship with uh, Mr. McIver. So anything she says is based on just her strict experience from that day of seeing him out of context, yeah. not, not used to seeing him and commenting on it. Well, I'm still waiting to hear what the smoking gun is of what he knows. Uh, right now, they're building him up as someone who has a personal relationship with Diane McIver, someone who is intimately involved in the details of his life, the financial details of her of her life, um, and this is probably going to go to the state's case of motive of why Mr. McIver would want Mrs. McIver dead and why she was more valuable dead than alive. But yet we still haven't heard that evidence that would 
uh, make that case. Uh, we're still listening. They're just right now building him up as someone who had access to all her accounts, created spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. His spreadsheets were so good that she chose to go with his spreadsheets rather than normal banking checkbooks to balance. And, uh, you know, he's someone that is now without a job, but who was her main uh, right arm that did everything for her except uh, grocery shopping and dry cleaning. Yep. So we've heard. So let's listen.